Um, so welcome. This is again Diana Toledo with uh, River Network, and uh, just want to welcome you to today's session: crowdsourcing, uh, excuse me, uh, anti-littering, social marketing for behavior change. Um, so we've got a couple of great presenters today: somebody from EPA and somebody from um, one of the Urban Water Small Grant recipients um, that has been doing this work on, on uh, litter prevention for quite a few years and has a very reputable program at the national stage. So looking forward to hearing their presentation. Let me go ahead and, and introduce um, some of you might be new to River Network. Um, and so um, our organization has uh, been around. We're about to turn 30 years old. And uh, over that, those three decades, we've un filled a unique niche within the environmental uh, community, focusing primarily on the more than 2,000 um, river and watershed organizations that are working at the state and local levels. Um, but we also try to st uh, strive to engage a, a larger audience than that. Um, and so that includes agencies, that includes local governments. Um, and today our focus is, uh, is around three strategic areas that are most important for healthy rivers. Um, strong champions, ample water, and clean water. And um, we provide access to our community, to training opportunities, to learning from their peers, and that's very much in line with today's webinar where, you, where you'll get to hear from both EPA and, uh, and an on-the-ground, an organization that's doing the work on the ground to reduce um, litter in their waterways. Uh, Today's, um, uh, I, I should, um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we are a membership organization and so um, there's a little plug, you can see that some of the benefits that you receive from being a River Network member, um, information, publications, training such as this one, um, River Rally is, uh, is our big national event, our national conference and so you get discounts to River Rally and uh, other discounts on equipment and resources. So please, if, if you've not looked into uh, a membership at River Network, um, take a look. We have a few different levels that we'd love to engage you further with, with the work that we do and get you access to some of those benefits. So today's uh, webinar is um, sponsored by uh, the Environmental Protection Agency and by the Urban Waters Learning Network, um, which if you're not a member of the Learning Network, this is a peer-to-peer -peer network of both people and organizations that are working on their urban waterways, focusing in the water, focusing in the communities around them. And so um, we have a speaker from Alice Ferguson Foundation who is an Urban Waters Learning Network uh, member and are glad to, to have them included here. Uh, so today's, um, today's presenters, um, before I, I, I get to today's presenters, let me just pull up a, a, a talk a little bit about why we're um, doing this, uh, this webinar today. Um, and that is trash and, and litter. I mean, a lot of us know this is a perennial issue in our, in our urban waterways and the history in our communities of using rivers and waterways as dumping grounds, unfortunately, remains with us. Um, in fact, many of you know, many of your own organizations, river and watershed groups, oftentimes turn to river cleanups as a, almost like a gateway activity to engage community members in their waterways so we can get individuals invested in restoring those waterways to health. But if you've ever been a regular participant of a river cleanup and you know the fr frustration of coming back to a river stretch where you were in a cleanup a year ago or six months ago and you come back to the same location to find that you're still pulling large amounts of, of litter yet again. Um, and so with today's session, our presenters are going to share their own experience in keeping the trash out of the waters, which is the ultimate solution using social marketing approaches in order to do that. Um, so before I turn and introduce our speakers, I do want to, um, Aaron, if you would pull um, the poll, we're interested in uh, getting a sense of who is in the room and um, understand a little bit about the strategies that you have used to address issues of litter in your own community. So. Um, hopefully you see a poll in front of you. Um, take a minute to um, select which of these strategies, whether it's field work to identify cleanup sites, 
monitoring sites over time to see if, uh, if the conditions have improved, um, if you've launched your own social marketing campaign, or if you do something else related to trash reduction, um, if you would give us a sense of what that is by um, turning to the question mark on the right hand of your screen to provide additional detail on what that is. So go ahead and take a second um, to submit your answer and I'll keep an eye on the question box to see if anybody is, um, is sharing their strategies. Um, and I know there's a little bit of a delay here so I want to be patient as we hear those. So the poll is open. Okay, so we've got about 70% of you are doing field work to identify cleanup sites. About half of you are monitoring sites over time to see if their conditions have improved. And great, about 44% of you um, are launching or, or putting in place, implementing your own social marketing campaigns. Great, so there's a lot of expertise in the room. Um, and there's a few other, um, I don't know if people are seeing the question box. It sounds like there's about a third of you who are doing other things in addition to these responses. Um, okay, I'm not seeing those come in. Okay, let's go ahead and close that poll. That's very helpful. Um, it's great that there's uh, so many of you doing your own social marketing campaigns. One of the things that I will turn to at the end of this webinar is, though today's session is structured really to hear from our presenters and ask them questions, if there is interest among those of you here in this webinar um, to participate in a peer group, maybe just over, over a phone line, to exchange information and learn from one another about what you're all doing and what's working, what's not, we would love to um, provide an opportunity for you to do so. And so in the um, follow-up email that you will receive likely tomorrow um, with uh, just information and following up on the webinar, we'll, I'll include my email so that you're, we're sure to, um, you, you can let me know if you're interested in talking to others who are doing this work. It would be great to find ways for you to connect further. Okay, so with that, I want to introduce our, our two presenters. Um, we've got Emma Marshall, Marshall from um, US EPA, and Emma is an ARISE research participant that supports the work of the Trash Free Waters program within the Office of Water at EPA. She has a master's in environmental management from Duke University Nicholas School of the Environment. Um, but as she says, she's been talking trash since she was a little girl combing the beach with her family. So Emma will go up first, telling us about the EPA programs. And then we've got Laura cattell Noel with the Alice Ferguson Foundation. Um, Laura manages all aspects of the Trash-Free Potomac Watershed Initiative. So that includes their outreach, education, and their stewardship programs. She's got over eight years of experiencing managing and implementing community-based stewardship projects across the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, previous to that, Laura worked with the University of Virginia, the National Aquarium, and the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. And she has a BS in environmental science and a master's degree also in environmental science from the University of Virginia. So I want to welcome Emma, Laura, and um, go ahead, let's uh, turn it back, uh, we'll turn it to Emma first. Um, I will say there'll be uh, time for questions, but please, as the presenters go through their presentations, do um, just track your questions using the chat box, or excuse me, the question box on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll just take time at the end um, to address all of those. So go ahead and, and use that throughout the presentations. And with that, Emma, it's all yours. Thank you, Deanna. Hello, everyone. I'm really glad to be here sharing information about the United States Environmental Protection Agency's Trash Free Waters Program. I am not a federal employee, so I need to offer the disclaimer that I am an ORISE research participant supporting the work of the EPA's Trash Free Waters Headquarters team. Therefore, this presentation has been reviewed by EPA employees for technical accuracy, but any opinions I share are my own. 
Any references to products or commercial enterprises does not imply agency endorsement. I don't. Huh. It worked before. Are you having a problem moving the slides? Yeah, it's Try. not clicking the word. Try clicking on the slide. Okay, everybody, hang tight for a second. Maybe we can get Aaron to forward the slides. There you go. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm really looking forward to engaging with you all and hearing what Laura has to say about the Alice Ferguson Foundation social marketing campaigns. Um, so let's dive right in. The Trash Free Waters program is focused on addressing trash and waterways through a variety of projects and initiatives designed to reduce the sources of land-based litter. One of those ways is to connect with all of you who are participants of this webinar um, so that we can discuss trash pollution in waterways. And we'd love to engage with you further. Was that me before that transitioned it or was that Erin? Okay, so I'm talking to you today because trash and waterways is a huge urban management issue and one of the most important ways we can tackle litter is through behavior change. Since visible pollution can often be an indicator for other water quality issues, addressing sources of litter can have lots of added benefits. Trash is a low hanging fruit, so to speak. Aside from an aesthetic issue, solid waste pollution in a community is a public health problem and it poses a threat to many different species. Although this picture is a nice wave, I'm not sure I'd want to surf there. Um, in addition to impacting tourism, trash hinders shipping, fishing, and other industries that rely on clean waterways. Ooh. I don't know what just happened. We're having some folks report that they can't see these slides. Um, please chat in if you're having that issue. The slides are coming through on my second screen just fine. So I would say uh, please go ahead, Emma, and allow Aaron to forward the slides for you. Okay, sounds great. So if you can read our goal statement at the bottom of this slide, um, our mission to have zero trash getting into waterways is quite a lofty goal, um, but despite the barriers, we're making positive strides towards a cleaner and safer environment for everyone every day. We're shooting for the stars because water quality is a cornerstone for environmental health. And to do this, the Trash Free Waters program works with a broad network of stakeholders. Many of them are community leaders, such as yourselves, participating in this webinar. So we make sure that our projects are place-based projects that are appropriate for reducing the sources of land-based litter because geographically, environmentally, and socially, all of the characteristics of our communities can differ, um, which is why we prevent litter by addressing behavior change. Um, so each education campaign and um, behavior change effort that we put forward is really tailored to the community. So this brings me into the four 
focus areas that we talk about in the Trash Free Waters program. Um, those are sort of the pillars that we build our foundation upon. Um, and it's really all equal weight among the pillars, but I numbered them just for this slide so that it was easier to transition through. Um, they all go into our holistic national strategy. Number one is research, and at this time our team is supporting research into the fate and consequences of plastic pollution because sound science is necessary to inform citizens about public health risks and about improper waste disposal practices. Number two, we engage many international partners on research and lessons learned to successfully collaborate on projects that will reduce trash loadings into the marine environment. For the past few years, the EPA Office of International and Tribal Affairs has coordinated the Trash Free Waters efforts aimed at preventing aquatic trash in communities through behavior change and infrastructure development. Number three, a lot of our programmatic initiatives are tailored to place-based opportunities. So our regional and state partners work together to highlight and meet the needs of their communities. I'll talk more on that pillar later. And number four, we see public-private partnerships as a key component to our program strategy because businesses and academic institutions have a role to play in how we reach the consumer as we cooperatively work to address the sources of aquatic trash. And then the next slide. Oh. I don't know how to get there. Aha. So a 2009 survey completed by one of EPA's partner stakeholders, Keep America Beautiful, hopefully you all have heard of this organization, as well as the EPA. <laughs> The Keep America Beautiful study estimates that public and private organizations in the United States annually spend about $11.5 billion to clean up litter that is already in the environment. Basically, it's expensive to keep reacting to a problem that is not expected to go away if you don't address the sources, which is why the Trash Free Waters program is using proactive initiatives and partnerships to focus on prevention because remediation of aquatic litter requires more time and money <laughs> and is next to impossible if you are talking about a small enough scale, especially um, for the microplastics and microfibers emerging issues. So, next slide. I still don't know if I'm doing it or if Erin is. Aha. So this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, I'm not sure if you'd call this irony or the inverse of the trash problem, uh, but I think this quote sums up my perspective on trash pollution because every project we implement, no matter how small, means that the ocean is less polluted. So some of the more commonly cited statistics are that 60 to 80 percent, you can stay back on the other slide. I just want you to soak it in all of Mother Teresa's brilliant wisdom um, while you think about some of the statistics that I am about to share with you all. Um, some of the more commonly cited statistics are that 60 to 80 percent of ocean trash is plastic and we are still learning how ubiquitous microplastics are in the environment and, most recently, in our drinking water. It is scary to think that there could really be one pound of plastic for every three pounds of fish in the ocean by 2025. Since some 5 to 12 million metric tons of plastic are estimated to enter the ocean annually on a global scale. But truthfully, 
That range is dwarfed by the more than 300 million metric tons of virgin plastic created annually. From those 300 million metric tons, about 37% of that plastic ends up as packaging or single-use items. So it really is all in the consumer's hands. I just want to reiterate that since the majority of aquatic trash is plastic and almost half of that plastic produced annually ends up as packaging or single-use consumer items, we often have to target consumer behaviors as they relate to proper disposal of those items. Next slide. Every year, Ocean Conservancy hosts an international coastal cleanup where over half a million volunteers collect data on litter in the environment. These numbers are from their 2016 International Coastal Cleanup Report, where over 18.3 million pounds of trash was collected. So while not all aquatic trash is plastic, it is important to note that plastic has some serious impacts once it is outside the managed waste stream. Plastic is just a category of materials, and each of the many different types of plastic interact with the environment in a unique way. So our program supports ongoing research into the environmental consequences of different types of plastic litter. Some of them seen here in the infographic and the, the pictures on the slide. So just two weeks ago, both Laura and I participated in the 2017 International Coastal Cleanup here in DC. We worked with other non-governmental organizations and many concerned citizens to clean up the Anacostia River. While cleanup events are great community events, and I very much enjoyed participating, um, it was a beautiful day, the Trash Free Waters program and other community cleanup event organizers I've worked with tend to focus on prevention because cleanup events are just a tool that can be used to gather data and engage stakeholders rather than a sustainable solution to cleaning up the large problem that we face with trash in waterways. And as you can see from the infographic, common trash from consumer goods makes up the majority of what we see as coastal marine litter. Plastics in the aquatic environment are of increasing concern because their persistence and their effect on the environment, wildlife, and human health. Which brings me to the next slide. I'm not sure if you have heard this before, but the solution to pollution is not dilution. From Keep America Beautiful's Crying Indian PSA to the Don't Mess with Texas and the Take Three for the Sea campaigns, consumer behavior has been highlighted as one of the pathways to addressing litter. And the Trash Free Waters program is dedicated to being part of the aquatic trash conversation because we're working with many stakeholders to tackle the issues related to litter making its way into our waterways. Key factors in our project development are the place-based, community-driven, multifaceted, and forward-looking aspects of projects, which we prioritize ahead of simple cleanup events. While we aim to stop solid waste pollution, we work with our stakeholders and our partners to understand the local environmental context as well as the human or social context of a community before beginning a project. Oftentimes, trash pollution prevention is just one piece of the water quality puzzle, so many of our projects will highlight reduction of litter in conjunction with other community benefits, such as remediation of illegal dump sites or reductions in stormwater runoff and therefore other non-point source pollutants. It's really amazing to see that focusing on the behaviors we want to change can change those behaviors and promote more sustainable, long-lasting benefits within 
the communities rather than prescriptively interfering with the community by regulating or um, policing any type of litter um, behavior. So next slide. So how do we change behaviors? <laughs> um, of course, at the Trash Free Waters program, um, we do build waste audits into some of our projects, and they're a helpful tool for project development so that the community can see the size and the scope of their trash, pol trash pollution problem. So really, our first step is identifying what the post-consumer waste is that we want to address and tackle. Um, and for smaller pieces of litter and microplastics or microfibers, um, standard water quality monitoring protocols are in the works. But larger identifiable items um, that we can see packaging branding or environmental context, like your local market on the corner um, next to the creek, um, make it easier to, for an initial hypothesis for where the litter originated from. And whether it's a group action like releasing balloons and sky lanterns or a small action like leaving a disposable cup next to an overflowing trash can, we, can, we have to change the misconception that someone will always be there to pick up the trash after us. While there are occasionally people who have to clean up a concert ground or a sports stadium, it's the normalization of littering behavior that makes it easier for others to leave their trash in the environment outside of an enclosed venue. So sometimes the barriers to seeing the desired behavior can be different um, high level issues like limited access to infrastructure um, but they can also be smaller um, education barriers and misconceptions or just public lack of awareness about proper waste disposal practices. So really the simplest thing that we're trying to tackle is people placing litter on the ground next to what they perceive to be the appropriate waste management system. Um, so it's really the small acts that we try to provide the tools for at this time. And really, that's where we get into the community work. Because next slide. We get things done through networks. So social diffusion of our programs and our campaigns is really the biggest way that our national program works on a local scale. And we're connected to so many other networks as a network of our own, which is why I'm talking to you all through the Urban Waters Learning Network. So the National Estuary Program programs have long-standing networks and forward-looking comprehensive conservation and management plans, or CCMPs. Um, we've been working internally with EPA partners and their programs in order to provide support for their stakeholders when aquatic trash measurement and prevention is one of their priorities. The specific geographic boundaries of the estuaries lead to lead the project coordinators towards a holistic or comprehensive approach, which is why we help develop materials and partners for their programs. And as you all know, litter is a man-made pollutant, so if all of the sources are related to human systems, then all of the solutions are also related to human systems, which is why we are going to be working much more closely with the Urban Waters Program and the Urban Waters Federal Partnership and the Urban Waters Learning Network. You all are doing great work in your communities, I'm sure. 
So this is my invitation to you all to partner on multiple projects in the future that address trash pollution in your waterways, your communities, and your watersheds. And just for some other information, at the regional level, the Trash Free Waters Program Coordinators are the federal co-leads for the Marine Debris Working Group. And that working group is a great way for us to talk about um, behavior change on the regional scale across multiple states. Um, our, our member bodies are on track, actually, to implement a community-based social marketing campaign focused on balloon release behavior. So that is what we are currently tackling with the Mid-Atlantic Regional Planning Body. And obviously, we have lots of other partners that we work with through our EPA regional offices, different state agencies, and other nonprofit and for-profit for groups that we um, know are interested in tackling the trash problem in their communities. So next slide. So it's actually really difficult for me to outline every project that we're working on because they are so tailored to the communities, but we use partnerships and social diffusion techniques to influence the state of litter um, in the environment that you all live in, work in, and enjoy. So check out our website. It is listed on the slide. Um, we have a bunch of great resources. Some of them are listed on the slide as well. Um, our flow newsletter most recently came out in August, so I recommend that you take a look at that. I actually wrote a piece on my trip to River Rally this past year, which was wonderful, hosted by the Urban Waters Learning Network um, and the others on this presentation. So really, all of our resources are out there. Well, a lot of our resources are out there. And if they're not out there yet, we're still working on them. And we'd love to work more with you on other resources. So next slide, if you will. Feel free to contact me with any questions you have. Um, or any specific inquiries on future partnerships. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Emma, so much. Um, it's great to hear, as many of you know, the, the Trash Free Waters program of the EPA is now in the same grouping as the Urban Waters program at the Office of Water. So um, I know we're all looking forward to finding opportunities for um, grantees of urban waters to intersect and inter uh, and, and collaborate with your program. Given um, our time constraints, rather than take questions, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to Laura, but encourage everybody to use the question function to put forth um, any questions that you might have for Emma. We'll come back at the end and, uh, and uh, address all of those together. So go ahead, Laura. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you, Diana, um, and thank you, Aaron, and all the other folks at the River Network for all your hard work organizing this um, and, and doing all this tech stuff. I know that can uh, be a, a, a good amount of work, so thank you all for organizing that. Um, and thanks, Emma, for setting the stage um, really well. Uh, the, as many of you know, the EPA um, Trash Free Waters uh, folks are great partners and um, have really um, helped to push the field forward on this, so I want to thank them uh, for their leadership. So as Diana mentioned, my name is Laura cattell Knoll, and I work at the Alice Ferguson Foundation. Uh, we are an environmental nonprofit uh, based just outside of Washington, D.C. Um, and we um, are, I'm excited to talk to you today about a lot of our litter prevention work, which uh, focuses on changing behaviors using a community-based social marketing campaign. So 
So it's our mission uh, to connect people to the natural world, sustainable agricultural practices, and the cultural heritage of their local watershed through education, stewardship, and advocacy. Um, we've been around since about the 1950s, um, so we've worked with a lot of folks um, in the DC metro region. We have a number of programs. Two of our programs are focused primarily on education with um, youth. That's our Bridging the Watershed program and our Hard Bargain Farm program. Um, but the program that I work on that I'm going to be speaking about today is our Trash Free Potomac Watershed Initiative. Um, and it's really our goal to connect people to their local watershed um, uh, through the issue of trash and litter. Um, as many of you know, uh, trash and litter is a really accessible issue that anyone can see. Um, anyone um, has, everyone has familiarity with it. We all produce trash. Um, and so it's a really great way to get folks thinking about how what we do on the land impacts um, the water. So we partner with communities uh, to prevent litter um, and, and clean up the watershed. Um, and we've been doing that for um, about, about 30 years now. So we work throughout the Potomac River watershed. Um, and that's because our headquarters is right along the Potomac River, um, just south of, of DC. So we can look out our window and, and see the river, which is an amazing, amazing view. Um, uh, the Potomac River watershed, for those of you that don't know, uh, covers nearly 15,000 square miles, including parts of Pennsylvania, Virginia, Maryland, West Virginia, um, and Washington, D.C. Um, but part of why we focus on um, the water is because uh, the Potomac River is actually the source of drinking water for 80% of the people in the D.C. metro region. Um, and that's our target audience. So when we're working with community members or school students, um, it's very easy to say, you know, did you brush your teeth this morning? Well, did you know that that water comes from the Potomac River? And that's why, um, that's why we need to care about it and protect it. So as many of you may know, um, the Potomac River is not um, one of the cleanest rivers. Um, it's in fact one um, that's considered endangered. So it um, has a number of pollutant issues. Um, some of the tributaries that go into the Potomac include the Shenandoah River and also the Anacostia River. Um, and the Anacostia River in particular um, has um, a, a lot of trash that comes through through that river and actually so much um, that there's a TMDL for trash or a total maximum daily load um, for trash for the Anacostia River. Um, and so that means that the jurisdictions within that watershed, which includes Washington, D.C., and then two counties in the state of Maryland, Prince George's County and Montgomery County, um, have to significantly reduce the amount of trash in the river. Um, and of course, it's stormwater runoff that often carries that trash from um, our urban streets um, into, into the river. We like to say if it's on the streets, then it's in the stream. So uh, like many of you all, we um, began this work with a cleanup about 30 years ago. Um, and we've worked since then annually with um, partners and volunteers to clean up and track litter uh, throughout the watershed. Um, this past year, we had 270 cleanup sites throughout the watershed, um, which is, is pretty amazing. I'm always so inspired to see our volunteers come together like that. Um, and it really can be a transformative experience for volunteers. But um, as, as sort of has already been alluded to, um, it's um, not necessarily uh, the ultimate solution. Um, despite that, we have removed uh, you know, almost more than 7 million pounds of trash and worked with almost 150,000 volunteers. Um, and so we've, we've made a dent um, in, in the issue, but we haven't um, really gotten, this work wasn't really getting at the root cause. So it was in about 2005 um, that we started thinking, how can we um, work ourselves out of a job on this? How can we make sure that there isn't trash to pull out of the river anymore? Um, and that's really when we got into thinking about behavior change um, and how we can encourage socially responsible behaviors like proper disposal, uh, proper disposal of trash. And for any of you that have gotten into behavior change work, um, you will know that it's very complicated. Um, there's a lot of different things that go into any individual behavior, and that's different for um, you know, different people. And so there's um, knowledge, there's attitudes, values, there's context, beliefs, um, 
you know, are you, are, is it, what's your social context, what have your experiences been, um, what's happening in your community, your background, um, and so it's, um, it's very complicated uh, to think about changing a behavior, and it's kind of intimidating, actually, so if, um, that's how I feel, so if any of you are feeling intimidated, don't worry, um, it's still possible, but um, all these variables mean that we really need to hone in on what our key goals are. And we really need to be very specific about, um, about our audiences and about the behavior um, that we're trying to change and the context in which we're trying to change it. Um, and that can uh, help to um, mitigate the impact of all these different variables. If we really hone in, um, that can help us to clarify our message. So that's what led us to social marketing, um, which is using traditional marketing techniques to influence um, and encourage a socially responsible behavior, or in this case, an environmentally responsible behavior. Um, for those of you um, that are familiar with um, traditional marketing techniques, um, perhaps this uh, graph will be familiar. This is an adoption curve. So it helps us think about the kinds of folks, uh, you know, the different categories of folks that are likely to um, uh, be an early adopter of a product or a behavior, and then folks who are likely to be a late adopter of a product or behavior. Um, so the product example here is maybe smartphones. So there are folks who were early adopters of smartphones. Um, they, you know, had the very first iPhone, um, and they're in that that the beginning um, uh, category of folks. Um, that really they just needed some education, they just needed some information. They found out there was a, a new iPhone coming out, what store did they go to, um, and they were really, um, they showed up, they went out of their way to get that product um, because they were enthusiastic and eager for that product. Um, and then uh, on the other end, the people who are sort of late adopters of something like smartphones are maybe only now getting a smartphone because there aren't any other options. They, you know, they're old phone dies and they go to the store and, and a smartphone is their only option so they, they sort of um, begrudgingly uh, get a smartphone. Um, and for those folks, uh, they're really the make me folks that you really have to make them adopt that new product or that new behavior. So then everyone in between um, is, is what we would call the help me folks that just need, um, they just need a little push um, to adopt that new product or that new behavior. So the smartphone analogy is if you go to your, you know, cell phone provider and they have some sort of a, a deal, you know, you get a discount on a new phone or you can upgrade your phone for a reduced rate. Um, so those are the help me folks that aren't the early adopters, they're not going out of their way to get a new product, um, but they will adopt it when that makes sense and when it um, is, is convenient for them. Um, so that's sort of the traditional marketing framework that social marketing um, thinks about. And um, we've used some of these same ideas, these categories, um, to look at littering behavior um, and to encourage, um, you know, a responsible disposal of trash. Um, and I'm sure many of you and, and environmental folks for many years have been doing that education piece of talking to people about why trash and litter is a problem and talking to them about how um, we can do better. But that only reaches 20-25% um, of the population. Um, and we've reached those folks. <laughs> They're already uh, you know, properly disposing of the trash. So we need to think about these other folks. Um, and that's really what led us to social marketing as a way of targeting these, um, these middle folks. Community-based social marketing is really just doing that social marketing on a local scale and doing it in partnership with um, community organizations and community members who can really speak to um, what would resonate in their context um, and who can help um, design the campaign and implement it um, really from the ground up. Um, and there's a lot of research out there saying that that's the most effective um, way um, because these are already people in the community who are trusted, who are trusted voices, and so we really want to work um, in close partnership with them to um, develop and, and implement um, any social marketing um, campaign. So there's a number of steps to developing a campaign, if that's something um, that you're thinking about. Um, the first is to um, hone in on what's that behavior that you're looking at, um, and then also you need to define um, your audience very specifically. Um, and your context very specifically. And again, that's that razor focus 
um, that helps um, helps to sort of weed out all those other behavior change variables and just be very specific about this behavior and this audience. Next, you want to identify barriers um, and benefits to changing behaviors. Um, so with any behavior, there's um, a barrier that prevents someone from making that change. But then once they do make that change, there's usually a benefit to them as well. And so you want to identify those different barriers and different benefits. Um, and then based on that information, that will help you develop strategies. Um, there's a number of um, best practices in community-based social marketing, um, different strategies. Um, I think on the next slide I'll go over some of those. Um, and then once you've developed your sort of plan of attack, you want to pilot that um, pilot that campaign uh, and do some evaluation of that. Um, and that can be can be tricky, uh, but it, that evaluation part is really key um, to make sure that what you're doing is effective. Um, and and that's an important part of um, many traditional marketing strategies. And so uh, we want to adopt that in our social marketing um, so that we have that rigorous um, data piece. And then after all of this, then you can do broad scale implementation. You can take um, those strategies you developed um, and apply them at a, you know, a broader scale. Um, and you want to continue to evaluate. Um, but hopefully that pilot evaluation gave you some more information and some more um, data to help inform your broad scale implementation. So here's a list of some um, best practices in community-based social marketing. Um, I won't um, go through all of these strategies. Um, we don't don't have time, but there's some um, that are likely familiar to you all. Um, something like how-to skills is um, maybe you want folks to install rain barrels, but um, you're concerned that they don't know how, so you lead a workshop on how to install um, rain barrels. Um, another example um, is a, a commitment. Maybe you want someone to, you know, not use fertilizer on their lawn, so you have them sign a commitment that this year they're not going to use fertilizer on their lawn. Um, Again, I don't have time to go through all of these. Um, I have prompts bolded here because that's one that we um, use a lot in our approach, but we do use several of these. Um, and it turns out that using several of them is really important. Um, a multifaceted approach that, that highlights, um, uses multiple of these strategies is more likely to be effective. So as an example, um, we, uh, as uh, Emma mentioned and others, um, we have a regional litter prevention campaign. Um, and I'm just going to go through that process so you guys can see um, you know, how that worked for us, um, just a little case study of how, how we implemented those steps um, to change littering behavior. So first we began by selecting the behavior. Uh, for us that was obvious because we are trying to stop trash from ending up in the river. So the behavior we focused on was littering. Um, and our target audience is uh, people who engage in littering behavior. So if you um, are already properly disposing of your trash, then you're not in our target audience. Um, then third, the context. Uh, we were really wanting to hone in on folks that live in the DC metro region. So again, those three pieces that you must need to identify are the behavior, the audience, and the context. So then we did a series of focus groups. We've done um, a handful over the years um, with the goal of identifying barriers um, to not littering and also some benefits of not littering. Um, and we really found that a lot of the um, a lot of the benefits to not littering were really around um, community pride and also um, one's um, family. So things like, I don't litter in front of my house. Um, so that's a situation in which the benefit of not littering um, was, was appealing to someone. Um, and um, so some of our messaging utilizes that, that benefit that we want to keep um, our communities um, clean and safe spaces for our families. Um, so we want to we highlight that in our messaging we identified. Um, we also identified um, this sort of take control messaging. Um, so another benefit to properly disposing of trash is it um, can make you feel, you know, responsible and you're making a good choice and um, you're sort of taking control of the situation around you, taking control um, of your life, taking control of what's happening in your community. So those are sort of two key benefits that we identified um, and that we honed in on as important to our campaign. 
So we uh, went through those strategies and, and tried to figure out which ones would make sense for us. Um, I mentioned we use multiple strategies. Um, we use um, sort of intrinsic rewards, the feeling good about cleaning up a community, the feeling good about coming together with your neighbors and your family um, and your community to do something positive. We also use commitments, um, particularly um, from elected officials. We try to get commitments from them to uh, clean up the river, to um, protect um, and, and clean up green spaces. Um, and then we also use positive stories and positive framing, uh, but sort of our main push is through these prompts, which again is that messaging that I mentioned. And our key messaging is, your litter hits close to home, take control, take care of your trash. And again, that's just really reiterating uh, what we learned in the focus groups for some of the benefits to folks uh, for not littering. So we piloted this approach, these different strategies, um, first in a small neighborhood in Prince George's County in about um, 2011. Uh, and the figure on the left shows um, some littering rates that we did pre-campaign and post-campaign. Um, and again, this is that evaluation piece, which is super important. Um, and we actually do observations to see what percentage of people are engaging in littering behavior. Um, so we found that between before and after the campaign, we found about a 40% reduction in littering behavior um, during, during just a, a relatively short, short time period. Um, but, but during the implementation of that campaign. So based on that very, very small scale pilot, uh, we expanded to working about in about half of um, Washington, D.C. Um, and that was over a longer time scale, more like two years. Um, and that's the figure that you see on the right. And we found that that reduced littering behavior by about 30% um, over time. Um, and so we were really encouraged by these results. It, um, uh, seemed like our campaign was having an impact on littering behavior and, and was reducing it um, um, pretty significantly. So now we're at the broad scale implementation phase where we're working throughout all of the District of Columbia um, to partner with community members, um, to post these signs, um, to, to do other outreach and educational activities using those strategies that I mentioned, um, but all with the goal of really this broad scale reduction around littering behavior. Um, and we just started this work in 2016, uh, and it will go through 2019. So we don't have um, results to share yet from this project, um, but we're really encouraged by uh, the pilot scale work that we've done, um, and we're really excited to see, um, to see what the results are. Um, I'll say just lastly that this, this work is never done. You're always uh, revising and improving um, your campaign to more effectively uh, change behaviors. And so we recently updated it um, to reach Spanish speakers, so we now have the signs um, in Spanish as well as English. Um, and we also updated it with some new images and some new colors um, and even a hashtag uh, to appeal to millennials. Um, so that's, that's a big part of our process is constantly revising, um, rethinking, um, and, and going through that process again and again. It's sort of an iterative um, improvement process. So that's all I have for you um, today, but I just want to say thanks to all of you that are doing this work um, across the country. It's so encouraging that there are other folks um, working on this and that are implementing their own community-based social marketing campaigns, um, and I you know, look forward to connecting with you all after the webinar. Thank you so much, Laura um, and, and Emma, for both of your presentations. We have a few um, a few questions that have come in. Um, have either of you had experience working with the corporations whose brands comprise a disproportionate percentage of the trash? Is that something that you've, um, or, or Emma, in your case, that you know anybody who has, and, and how has that worked? Um. So definitely, um, at the EPA, we do engage with um, corporate partners. So the um, American Chemistry Council and other various large corporate partners, um, such as Coca-Cola or um, Nestle, have in the past worked with the Trash Free Waters program um, because hopefully it's well understood that there is no such thing as a pro-litter lobby. Um, no one is actually fighting for extra dumping of trash um, 
in your communities. It's really um, that they're the partners, um, even different um, sports arenas that we are working with um, don't want people littering in their communities. Therefore, um, they're business partners that um, help us educate consumers on the local level. Mm -hmm. um, we definitely, um, with the, the sports stadiums and the concert venues and any of those um, large arenas where it's possible to leave your trash not in a receptacle um, because it is well accepted that someone is coming around to collect catch the trash. Um, even in a movie theater, like leaving your trash at your seat um, is sort of a littering behavior that we, it's, it's the gateway, I guess, that we try to prevent. Um, so there are partners who want to see littering behaviors stopped and the partners who tend to have their branded items on the street. Mm -hmm. So Michelle, one thing you might want to, the, the question was posed by Michelle Lubke of, uh, in the Bronx, so um, you might want to follow up with Emma to see if there's any connections there or um, lessons learned that you might bring um, locally. I, a question was posed by Zoe Scott of the Heal the Bay, uh, a program coordinator at Heal the Bay in LA. Um, wondering if either of you know of any environmentally related volunteer or professional development in LA. Um, I think if I understand it, um, it would be around issues of working with high schools to engage, um, you know, engage uh, students in some of their volunteer experiences. So I don't know if that's something that either of you know. Um, and the last question, and, and then I'll let you guys answer. Um, what are your methods for measuring behavioral changes? Um, and uh, is there any movement towards place-based education on trash and littering in public schools in the DC area? So I think um, I'll leave it there and let you guys answer them just as briefly as you can in the last couple of minutes here. Yeah, this is Laura. I can take um, those last, uh, last mm -hmm. questions. Um, we uh, track changes in littering behavior through um, those behavioral observations that I mentioned. Um, so that's, um, we sit um, somewhere, you know, maybe a coffee shop, um, and look out the window where there's a trash can and hopefully also a recycling bin. Uh, and then we, um, you know, make notes if anyone engages in what we call a disposal behavior. So if they are walking down the street with, um, uh, you know, a plastic bottle, um, and if they throw it in the trash can, then it's, you know, that's, we mark that, or if they throw it in the recycling, we mark that, or if they throw it on the ground, we mark that, and that helps get, help us to um, get a baseline for what our littering rate was before the campaign, and then we do that during and after the campaign to see what sort of change um, the campaign created. So I hope that answers that question. Um, and then the other question about schools, um, we have a trash-free schools program, um, and actually the guidebook for that is available on our website to anyone who's interested in it. Uh, but our trash-free schools program um, is to get schools and school students thinking about this. Um, so it helps them with waste reduction, uh, litter prevention, and schoolyard cleanup projects, and provides resources and curriculum um, for them to implement that at, at different grade levels. So um, that's available on our website if anyone is interested. Great, thank you, Laura. Um, we're at the top of the hour. I just, it, in terms of wrapping up, I want to reiterate um, my my offer of earlier. Um, I finally was able to get in and see all the answers to some of the questions of what else are you doing around uh, litter prevention, and it sounds like there's a lot of experience uh, here in the room, whether it's um, uh, Michelle Lepke with the Bronx River Alliance, uh, partnering with the uh, New York City mayor on social media campaigns and on promoting reusables uh, in New York. Um, the Connecticut River Conservancy is taking a legislative approach, doing advocacy to pass bottle bills and tire return legislation to uh, prevent it at the stores. And then there's a lot of work that's happening, whether it's with documenting litter 
or putting in place floating trash traps to gather the litter in stream. Um, so there's a lot of experience. I do want to um, just say that if you're interested in, as a follow-up to this webinar, in getting together around the phone uh, with others and just share some information around education campaigns or other approaches that you're all using, um, let us know. I will put, uh, this is Deanna Toledo, I'll put my email and the follow-up um, my email address and the follow-up email you'll all get and if we have you know even just a handful of folks that want to do that more informal networking around litter prevention we'd love to help facilitate that and Emma and Laura have both uh, expressed interest in, in, in joining those calls if, um, if you want to have access to them for additional questions. Um, Aaron if you'd move the slide um, just to wrap things up um, well I do want to say well, if River Network's website has a, um, a recorded webinar that we did a couple of years ago on social marketing generally, uh, how to design a social marketing campaign, and there are some resources there for um, that will take you through step by step how to identify the messages, the audiences, the goals, etc. And so I want to encourage you to take a look at that. Um, it's you just look up social marketing on our website rivernetwork.org and it'll pop up for you. A couple of other things, we'll follow up with a recording, a few of you have, have um, asked about that and you'll also um, will follow up with an evaluation in that email for the peer call. And the last thing I want to say is um, coming up on Sunday is our deadline for River Rally workshop proposals. Um, there is a theme there around engaging community uh, around water restoration and, and, and river um, rivers generally. So if you're doing some, some of this work, uh, please consider sharing it with some of your peers at River Rally coming up next year in California. Um, but do get your proposal in uh, this week. It would be, would be great to hear more on this topic um, at, at Rally. So again, thank you everybody. We'll follow up with all that information in the recording um, and we look forward to, uh, to possibly connecting on a peer call if you're so interested. Um, and again, thank you Emma and, and thank you Laura for um, taking time today to share your work with, uh, with everybody else in the network. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and close the webinar out room. Thank you again. Bye-bye.